Hey guys, today I'm continuing with FNAF videos, even though like a third of you hated my last theory. Hey, it might need a few tweaks for a better fit, but in FNAF 1, 2, and 3, there are many plot holes satisfied with the Night Guard being a simulation test. Maybe it's being used for the purposes of getting a reaction out of the otherwise immobile suits. I don't know, but it makes sense. Anyways, love it or hate it, I have another theory. This time, largely based on the books, and yes, this video will continue contain spoilers. Honestly, I found the books infuriating as a theorist because almost every theory thought bubble I had ended up being canon in the books. I thought that Charlie might be remembering Sammy's abduction wrong and that Sammy might be off living with his mother somewhere safe. I also thought that Ella might somehow be the original Charlie as soon as they mentioned that Charlie used to have an identical dress when she was that small. Gosh, if I had been a little faster posting on FNAF, I could have gotten so many things right. But that's made me believe that the last theory thought bubble I had has to be correct too because so many clues line up. So one issue that never fully came together was the mystery of William Afton. There's a lot with Afton that's still unclear and it seems like he's dead as of the end of the fourth closet, but he never seems to stay dead for long, so who knows? And you know what bugged me most when I listened to the audiobooks? Afton seems to have some drastic issues that are never explained. The teens repeatedly say that Afton survived a Springlock incident before the events of the book. Yet, that's a complete assumption that I don't recall Afton ever confirming, especially since the Springtrap cutscene in FNAF 3 seems to largely parallel the end of the fourth closet. So assuming that Afton had previously been harmed in a suit is just that. A big and wrong assumption. True, Afton survives the spring locks that Charlie sets off in book one, but they describe Afton's previous scars as being more like an embossed design on his skin. If any of you have been violently injured before, the scars tend to be jagged and frightening, not almost decorative. So let's instead assume that the scars came from something else because Afton was definitely not purple guy, at least not in the physical appearance sense, during the silver eyes. It's also really odd to me that Afton lost a lot of weight between his fleeing the town after the children disappeared and his coming back to town to be the night guard at the mall. What's the reason or motivation behind that? Is the implication that he had the weight purged from his body during the supposed first spring lock incident? Because we certainly hear nothing about diet and exercise or a need to change his look to hide himself. I mean, Afton was suspected by the police, but they even said they had no proof of anything and had to let him go. So why drop the weight? Why is that important? Plus, Afton had been posing as Dave Miller, the night guard, for months before Charlie and the other kids came back to Hurricane. That means if Charlie was his end game, he had no way to know there'd be a foundation set up to bring Charlie back to town. Let alone that there'd be any reason for her to go explore Freddy Fazbear's. So it doesn't make sense for Afton to position himself in the hopes of that situation maybe happening someday. And if Afton wanted the animatronics, why didn't he take them out of Freddy's during his work shift and move them to a safer location miles away from the town? If you're a supervillain, you need to be smarter. Also, did anyone else find it bizarre that when Afton met Charlie, he said, oh, you're something beautiful, aren't you? It's so creepy and almost comes off sexually, even though it's not based on everything else we learn. It's more like something a father says to his daughter when she walks down the stairs dressed for prom, like there's some weird pride to that statement. But I'll get back to that in a second. The Silver Eyes also has a haunting paragraph about Afton. William Afton was the one who made Freddy's a business as he had the previous restaurant. Afton was as robust and lively as Henry was withdrawn and shadowy. He was a hefty man who had the ruddy geniality of a financially shrewd Santa Claus. That establishes for us that 1980s William Afton was a businessman with a really good personality. Yet that's not at all the person we meet in the books. Actually, the Afton we get to know better fits the description we get on Henry, withdrawn and shadowy. The Silver Eyes goes on to say that Afton had killed the children. Play knew it, the whole department knew it. He had been present for each abduction and he had mysteriously and briefly vanished at the same time each child went missing. A search of his house had found a room crammed with boxes 
boxes of mechanical parts and a musty yellow rabbit suit, as well as stacks of journals full of raving paranoia, passages about Henry that ranged from wild jealousy to near warship. This bothers me for multiple reasons. Usually, the business person is not a robotics engineer too, yet we find out in book two that Afton was a genius level engineer. Typically, those are two very different personality types and where the engineer is focused on making every tiny detail work, the businessman is focused on the bigger picture and how to turn a profit. It's not impossible for the two career paths to merge into one, but it is improbable. And the Afton we read about is certainly the former of that stereotype with no hint of the latter. Then we have the problem of the spring trap suit reference. The first book directly tells us that Henry was the one who wore the suits and enjoyed entertaining crowds in disguise. It's really unlikely that Afton would share that preference since he was an outgoing, sociable person. Then there's the extreme issue again of Afton's weight, and I swear I'm not fat shaming here, but it's been repeatedly established that the springlock suits have very little room in them. Even if you remove the mechanics, those suits will only allow up to a certain size person in them. So if you're being described as a Santa Claus body type, there's no way you could get a suit like that on. Even if he could somehow cram himself into Springtrap, his fat rolls would have triggered the mechanics after a few steps. Come on, the entire franchise harps on how fragile these locks are. Finally, for the police to find journals written by Afton that they called, quote, raving paranoia, yeah, that seems like another frightening clue. There's no specific talk about what Afton was raving about, and there's no reason why he should be envious of a man that was described as withdrawn and shadowy. And those journals were written after real Charlie had died and Henry was a mental mess. So again, not seeing what there is to be jealous of, it makes me think that the raving paranoia stemmed from legitimate fear that Clay and the other officers couldn't comprehend. Something like, Henry is after me, he's coming for me, I don't know what to do. And that's where I think the scars come back into play. Because based on everything we're given, I dare say that William Afton isn't himself anymore. Literally. I sincerely believe that Henry found a way to switch bodies with Afton. Now, before you go on about how my theory is going against the lore of the franchise, keep in mind that we're told, point blank, that magic played a role in making the animatronics combine with the souls of children. We really get no firm idea of what the magical component was, where it came from, or what else it could do. So can you really say for sure that body switching isn't a possibility? Or even that Henry found a way to mechanically reproduce his brain and put it into Afton's body. Let's also not forget that when Dave puts on the Springtrap head, he gets a completely different voice. It's like a split personality and where Dave was said to have a pitiful, sour tone in his voice, almost like he's angry to be himself. Somehow in the Springtrap suit, his voice becomes smooth and rich, almost musical, and it's called confident, somehow reassuring, a voice that might convince you of almost anything. Hmm, what voice have we heard in the FNAF video games that sounds like that? It's only now that I understand the depth of the depravity of this creature, this monster that I unwillingly helped to create. Don't forget to consider Aunt Jen in all of this too. She was Henry's sister and left town with a robotic Charlie who was elementary school age, yet somehow she gets a teenager upgrade of Charlie all the way in New York. Jen also collects Charlie's teen form and hides it in a trunk, which makes it seem like Jen was working with Afton, then she finally got fed up and fled when Charlie was upgraded. Why would Jen work with Afton, the man who allegedly murdered her niece and caused her brother's death? Uh-uh. I don't think so. Jen would only go along here if Afton was actually her beloved brother, Henry. Let me further lay out this scenario. Henry, a man who had no qualms with taking things apart to make them work again or to reuse pieces, loses his daughter, possibly due to his own obsession or mistake. Remember, the circumstances of Charlie's death are very vague. We just know that Springtrap was involved and apparently took Sammy away so that he could lock Charlie up in the lab 
lab alone? The memory never clarifies, but then we learn it's all kind of fake anyways, so who knows what the truth is? But refusing to let her go, the grief-stricken Henry takes Charlie apart and tries to put her back together several times, making himself more frustrated each time that his creation is not up to par with his former child. So, to further study how to make his robo-child more convincing, or how to engage with Charlie's actual spirit, he begins to abduct children while wearing an animal mascot costume for the sake of figuring out how to make the children living robots. Yes, you are hearing me correctly. I say that Henry killed all the other children. That's why not a single one of the ghost kids gives us the name William Afton or describes any of the features outside of wearing the rabbit suit. Which again, the suit fetish was a Henry thing. Afton would have never fit in a tight spring lock suit. That's why the spring locks were a crucial new design. They made it so that Henry could snatch a child in character, step out of costume, activate the animatronic parts, and send the robot back onto the public floor, making a full alibi for himself. Have you ever seen the congressional hearings on the internet? These old guys in charge of things have no idea how the internet even works. So I would say it's safe to assume that law enforcement in the 80s wouldn't understand the concept that a suit can be a costume or an independent robot. Meaning Henry can literally be in two places at once due to this lack of knowledge. Once Henry had the children and the experiments didn't gain the desired results, he grew restless and impatient. The fact that Henry liked being in costume says that he wanted to be loved, but had trouble finding that affection as a regular guy because he was so awkward and strange, which would have made him very jealous of Afton who had the better personality. And this type of envy would have gotten worse after Henry's wife and son Sammy took off after Charlie's murder. So using whatever magical forces Henry found while trying to keep Charlie's essence alive, Henry switched bodies with Afton, potentially marking up Afton's body with ritualistic symbols. Then Henry turned the suicide bot on Afton, who was stuck in Henry's body, making it look like Henry had killed himself. And Afton's body lost so much weight afterwards because Henry's mind had different eating habits. I imagine Henry assumed he would be the one that everybody looked at for the child abduction, so switching bodies made a nice extra layer of cover for him. But then Henry found out that Afton became the prime suspect in the missing children cases anyways, so he just fled town. There's two options here. Either Afton already had a family who lived somewhere else and he commuted to work at Freddy's five days a week, which would explain why the police searched his home but mentioned nothing of a wife or kids. Or after Henry took off in Afton's body, he tried to have a normal life and remarried, having children to fill the void of losing his twins. But when that family wasn't the fantasy that Henry built up in his head, he started making robots again, this time using the name Afton Robotics. Or maybe because Afton was the businessman who probably handled all the paperwork for trademarks, copyrights, patents, and so on, Afton Robotics LLC was the name of the old robotics firm and Henry just kept using it because why not? Then eventually, Henry had a new metallic family. Henry let Elizabeth become one with baby because he had already sacrificed one daughter and was trying to figure out the key that made the souls possess the mascots. And according to the last book, baby was already another version of Charlie, making baby the all-in-one daughter that Henry had been longing for but couldn't bring himself to love because she still wasn't just right. After the spring locks impaled Afton's flesh, the purple guy was born because of the body switching magic that kept Afton's body and Henry's mind alive. And everything else Afton slash Henry did was out of fear of dying because the terms of his magical situation and extended life weren't well defined. For whatever reason, he can't recreate the body switching spell. Like, hey, do you know the difference between a wizard and a sorcerer? A wizard has to study to use spells and a sorcerer has magic in their blood. Since magic was referenced as canon in the books, maybe Henry could use sorcery and after he switched bodies, he found that his natural talents didn't work, so he was stuck. That would also explain why Henry could bind kids to animatronics, but Afton couldn't and that made him crazy. Or maybe because human bodies are so flimsy, Henry's mind wants a more permanent robotic solution. Either way, the kids are definitely abducted in the fourth closet for the sake of immortality. Well, that and because Henry 
never abandoned his obsession with making animatronics that had a soul. It might not be reality, but you can't prove me wrong because Ultimate Custom Night plays the pronoun game, so everything you think is just an assumption. Well, that's all I have for now, but this video's not quite over yet. I get a lot of comments that say, do a theory on this topic, but I've already done those theories. So please consider going to my main channel page and clicking on the video tab so that way you can see everything I've done. You will probably find a lot of things you like that you never even knew that I posted. I want to let you know that I also have two other channels, Say Halo Goodbye Gaming and The Family Family Vlogs. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed enough to hit subscribe and share. I can use all the help I can get to let other people know that this channel exists. And if you made it this far, leave me a comment that says something like, hey, I made it to the end. And then let me know what kind of videos you want to see in the future. I can't make any promises, but the more people that request something, the more I can look into it. Okay, well, I love you. I'll see you in the next video.